what's going on everybody it's your boy m o d to the z yeah and i am back with uh another update for y'all uh this is gonna be part four i think oddly enough the last video i i titled volume three which the first two were part one and part two so i i guess i just had to start trying to confuse people if you're trying to watch them in order which is which and stuff but uh I'll try to keep better tabs on that to label them properly. But anyways, this is going to be part four of this monstrosity update that has been accumulating for about three plus years. So many, many more updates to come since we are on full quarantine. I'm locked down in the house and uh, and it seems like we're going to be locked down for a lot longer, which sucks as an independent business owner like myself because I don't have any money coming in. <laughs> so hopefully this doesn't last more than like three or four months because that is absolutely insane. Uh, but anyways, I digress again, <clears throat> like I've been saying before, I just, I have so many albums, but actually the good thing about not buying anything right now is I don't have anything coming in. So then I can finally start to catch up on all these, uh, updates and shit like that. So hope you guys are enjoying them out there. Uh, big ups to everyone that has been watching the videos and stuff. And, uh, yeah, thanks for the support guys. All right. So <clears throat> let's get right into this. Uh, first up here, uh, second to none's debut album. Of this self-titled second to none. Uh, this is an album that came out in 1991, and uh, it was actually produced the same year DJ Quick put out his first album, Quick is the Name, uh, fully produced by DJ Quick. Now, if you're a fan of early DJ Quick stuff, you're gonna love this record if you've never heard it because it literally sounds like DJ Quick. I mean, one of the guys in the group, KK, he actually sounds like DJ Quick too, so it's it's really bizarre and actually quite impressive that DJ Quick managed to produce his entire album that year and this one also. Not too many like debut albums uh, producers that are producing that much in one year. It's kind of crazy, um, especially for this time. But uh, second and on really really dope shit from top to bottom. It's just it's it's like a group DJ Quick album. So like I said, if you're a fan of Quick as the name and stuff like that, you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Some really dope West Coast stuff here. So. Can't go wrong with that. Absolutely love that record. Uh, next up here is uh, Busy B from 1988, Running Things. I, every time I think of Busy B, I always think of Wild Style. Uh, Wild Style came out in 1983, and uh, I just think of those, you know, those freestyle battles and shit like that. So, um, which which is kind of interesting too, because this album, Running Things, came out in 1988, and I always feel like it was almost too far removed from, you know, I, I wouldn't say like the height of his success and stuff. I mean, Wildstyle did put a lot of names out there for people to recognize and stuff. But I mean, you know, in retrospect, I mean, this album came out five years after Wildstyle. I just always thought that Busy B would have put out a record before 88, maybe like 85, 86 or something like that. But even with that said, <clears throat> even being so far removed from Wildstyle, this album still came out pretty damn dope. I actually really enjoy Busy B's record, man. Uh, the, the very odd and interesting thing about this record is that the song Suicide actually got a video. He made a video for the song 30 years after the release of this album. I can't think of any other group, artist, who ever did something like that. Just coming out of the woodworks and making a, a you know a video for a track off an album 30 years old. So I thought that was pretty cool. I think he did in like 2018 and stuff, but... Uh, good shit, man. I love... I, there, there's so many dope tracks on here, man. Um, but yeah, Suicide is dope. But yeah, Busy Beast. Darsky. Um, Next up here, we got uh, Cunny Lingua's debut album, Will Rap for Food. I uh, finally got my hands on a copy of this, man. I got up on Cunny Lingua's when they put out their second album. And unfortunately, even by that time, this album was actually really hard to find for a decent price. You know, this album came out in 2002, and that was a really bad time for me anyways. You know, 2003, I got up on them and stuff, and I was a broke student. I just sold off all my shit, and, you know, so there was no way I was affording a lot of this stuff. But, uh, yeah, this one was really hard to get for a lot of years for a good price. It was easy to find, but hard to find for a good price. And uh, I actually found this from a Canadian seller who gave it to me for a really good price, and oddly enough, actually recognized me on Disogs. So he was really cool. So big shout out to you. I can't remember what your name is right now, but thank you for hooking me up with a, with a great pristine copy of Cunning Linguist's first album because I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, great album. Self-titled actually produced a track on here, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. SOS wasn't actually part of the group at the time. He was kind of featured on a track here. Um, so then later on joined and stuff. But uh, I love this record, man. Top to bottom, really, really good Southern shit, man. Cunning Linguist, gotta love it. Uh, next up here is, of course, another Haystack album. Again, I I don't think I have to apologize for the, the glare every single time because we know that's going to come. It's just the way it is. I, I can't avoid the glare. I digress again. 
So this is Haystack's most recent album. This came out in 2016. Uh, he had actually taken a couple year hiatus even uh, before he did this record, and he hasn't put out one obviously since this time. Uh, this is like a very odd album. It's a double disc album, and the first disc is you know still standing. Second is is the what does it say D side or B side bangers? Oh, that's a D side B side bangers. Okay, so let me let me explain. The first disc is very personal. It's very slow. It's very story driven. It's very you know heartfelt and you know it's just you can tell he was going through a lot of shit at the time he made this so it's kind of hard to listen to unless you want to relate to that type of drama and that type of feelings and things like that generally not for really for me um i do like haystack quite a bit i like his storytelling but that stuff gets a little bit too personal it's a little bit too i, I almost want to say a little bit too i don't want to say corny but it's a little bit too mushy at times the second disc, which is called B-Side Bangers, which is more of, of Haystack's normal style, he does mix in those type of songs in, into his regular records and stuff, but it's like a whole album of just like kind of bangers. Not really his greatest bangers I've ever heard, um, but uh, I don't know. Hopefully Haystack comes back with something, you know, different, you know, later on and stuff, because this isn't really my favorite record by him, but yeah. So, anyways. Um, moving along. Jean Grey's uh, The Bootleg of the bootleg EP. I love that title, man, it's great. Now, Jean Grey is actually one of my all-time favorite female MCs. I love her, she rips mics, she's just a dope lyricist, she's got crazy charisma and style. I always like, she works with great producers, she's just got a really good flavor going on and stuff. This is pretty cool, man, you know, it's six tracks on here. Uh, it's short, but the last track is 45 minutes long. The six track is 45 minutes long and has a bunch of different tracks. So this thing, this whole thing runs like 65 minutes or something. It's kind of crazy. So you kind of get your money's worth with this. So if you see this around, you're like, eh, I don't really want to buy an EP for $5 or something like that. It's actually kind of worth it. It's pretty good shit, man. But um, if you're a fan of Jean Grey, this came out in 2003, Baby Grande style. Um, finally got up on it. Love it. Great stuff. Picked that one up for like two bucks. So I couldn't, I honestly, I couldn't pass it up. So. Uh, moving along to Menace Clan, Da Hood, 1995. This was released on Rap a Lot Records. Uh, this was a group from South Central uh, Los Angeles, and um, nothing but fucking the beats on here, are straight bangers and shit. It's the general, and you know the, you know most of the guys that were producing for Rap a Lot at the time, like No Joe, Mike Dean, uh, Brad Jordan, which is Scarface produced on here and stuff. So the beats are straight gangster shit. Beats are awesome. Uh, lyrically, man, this is probably one of the most racist albums ever to come out. It's just so blatantly blunt with the rhymes. Like, I mean, the very first track, they're talking about killing crackers, and it goes right down to, like, even the last song is called Kill Whitey, and they're chanting Kill Whitey, but throughout the whole album, it's just referencing killing Whitey and how much they hate Whitey and shit. It's really funny, actually, like, to listen to this album, you know, 25 years later, and it's just... I don't think you would even hear an album like that nowadays. People are just so PC and just... You just wouldn't get away with this type of shit, but this was definitely a product of its time. They were some pissed off motherfuckers on this record, but it makes for a very entertaining album. The beats are dope and shit. Uh, yeah, man, it's just got some really good stuff, but, and I'm very happy to find a copy of this. I, I think I got this one for like 7 or $8, which was an amazing price because uh, it usually goes for a lot of money. And it was one I missed back in the day, and I'm so happy to actually knock this one off the wrap a lot. Um, you know, collection because uh, it's good. It's really entertaining. So, yeah, so that was Men's Clan. Uh, then we got Three Six Mafia's first album, Mystic Styles from 1995. Uh, this is such a dark, dark, atmospheric type album, man. I really like this style on here, man. I'm generally not like too much into horrorcore. I don't really consider this to be like horrorcore. It's just, it has a really kind of dark, atmospheric type approach to it, which I really like. Um, you know, 36 Mafia had been doing it for years before this and stuff, and of course they have a track on here, uh, Live Live By Your Rep, and it's, uh, it's a diss track towards Bone Thugs and Harmony, basically saying that Bone stole their type of flow and shit like that. I can see where they're coming from with that, uh, you know, considering how they rap and shit like that, so it kind of makes sense, but uh, yeah, oh, lo and behold, man, whatever. There's still two totally different types of groups, but uh, either way, man. I like both groups, but uh, Three Six Mafia's Mystic Styles, man, I highly recommend this, man. I love Three Six Mafia's 90s stuff, man. It's really, really great. Even their later stuff's actually really good, too, as the group kind of changed members and, and some members passed away and things like that. Like, Three Six Mafia was always changing with, like, every record. It's kind of crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, lots of bangers on here. I love the dirty, dusty, analog sound to this album. It just sounds phenomenal. It's crazy. It's, like, not even mixed that great, but it just has this... <laughs> I mean the overall product the sound of the product 
just totally fits the content. It's great. So, yeah. DJ Paul and Juicy J, good record. Uh, next up here is uh, Sean Price's Master P mixtape. This is an official mixtape. It's actually not even a burned disc, which I was quite surprised when I got this that it actually wasn't a burned disc. Because uh, I actually ordered this from the boot camp or the Duck Down site a couple years back and shit and actually got received it, which was kind of cool. So uh, this is, came out in 2007. He'd already dropped uh, Monkey Bars and Jesus Price Superstar and then this mixtape came out. So this was pretty full-fledged Sean P at this time. You know, it's a mixtape, man. It's got lots of features, lots of, you know, usual cats on here, of course, Black Moon, you know, Smith & Wesson, things like that. It's dope, though, man. It's just Sean P just... I, Sean P mixtape, man, I, it's entertaining, man. Really, really entertaining, so can't go wrong with that. Here, I'm going to move this over before that pile of gets too, gets too high and falls over as usual. Uh, next up here is Trick Daddy's uh, debut album, Based on a True Story, 1997, I believe. Slip and Slab Records. This album sounds like major West Coast, man. Sounds major West Coast influence. Like a lot of these kind of Southern albums in the later 90s and stuff. Usually sound major West Coast influence. Uh, this is no different and stuff. I actually really like this album. It's probably my favorite Trick Daddy album, to be honest. Uh, yeah, but the album cover, though, man. <laughs> How can you not say that's not a ripoff of ODB's album cover? It's pretty much... This, I think it's actually a homage to it, to be honest. I don't think he's blatantly ripping off. I think it actually is technically not even supposed to be just you know rip it's like a homage to that which kind of makes sense with the food stamp card and stuff but um yeah i got jt money on here jamal man from illegal was actually on this record which was really cool um good shit uh but yeah jt money um yeah good shit so based on a true story trick daddy's first album this was a cool find because i'd actually been after this one for years trying to find a decent copy of this man that glare is bad Elza, I witnessed my growth, the mixtape, 97 to 2004 recordings, uh, double disc, um, which is, you know, I mean, a lot of these recordings are, you know, not mixed the greatest and shit like that, but, uh, you know, that's what I like about these type of releases. It kind of shows a lot of different flavors from these cats and what they were doing in this time period before they, you know, either joined groups like Slum Village and things like that, but just bangers, man. Lots of really good shit on here, so... Elza, I witnessed my growth. Love this mixtape. Well, double mixtape and shit, so. Good stuff. I mean, they call it a mixtape. It's it's songs that are just compiled. It's like a compilation. Oh, uh, man, this next group here, man. This is this is a group that I, I first heard, I want to say, around 2000. I was way late on them. I didn't know who they were. No. No, it was probably before I went. So I would say probably 99-ish or something like that. And I was fucking blown away because my buddy told me that these cats were from Sweden. And I was like, what the fuck? Really? Infinite Mass. The Infinite Patio. Man, this is crazy. So this is a Swedish group that completely sounds like they're straight from the West Coast. All their music is straight G-Funk. Uh, gangster wine type music, man. If you just heard these guys blindly, you'd be like, hey, that's totally a group from you know, from the West Coast and stuff. The content is straight West Coast. The beats, just the approach, everything. Um, yeah, so 1995, it's very typical sound in 1995. Just nothing but fucking bangers on here, man. Just nothing but bangers. Red, white, and blue. 9-5 uh, vibe. Man, just like, Area Turns Red. I think that was, that was one of the singles off the album. G-Ride. It's just crazy, dude. Unbelievable Swedish G-Funk shit like that. Uh, kind of flew under the radar. I mean, I didn't even hear about this until, like I said, until the later 90s, so that was kind of crazy. But glad I got up on these guys and finally found a couple uh, copies of these albums for cheap because <laughs> just never hear anybody mention these guys. But And then they followed it up with their 1997 album, uh, Always Something, Always Something. And this is kind of interesting because this is when they really tried to heighten their... In really tried to you know exploit their name a little bit more by getting a lot of west coast known cats on this record because the first album really doesn't have any features it's just them over these straight west coast g-funk type beats and things like that uh this album right here actually features um it's got shorty on this album mc8 uh polar bear uh prodigy from south central cartel melly mel's on the record a few other cats and stuff but it's got production from qd3 mc8 prodigy you know polar bear and shit so you get more of the gangster, uh, gangster wine, G funk stuff like that on here, uh, but with some of the you know more famous uh, MCs from the West Coast to kind of sell your record too. I don't think the album is as good as their first one, honestly. Some of the features are pretty good. I love MC8's verse on uh, Comptown to Stocktown. 
it's kind of, you know, pretty much what the song should be called, right? Um, it's more of the same. It's a long record, and uh, but I, even with all the features and stuff, I still think the first one's better. I know these guys have a couple more albums after this, which I've actually never heard, so maybe I'll get, get up on those someday too. Uh, let me know if you've actually heard some of the other, I think like the 2000 stuff from Infinite Mass. No idea what it sounds like if they change up their style or whatnot, but uh, pretty interesting albums to have though. So, you know. <clears throat> oh yeah, I got mad allergies right now. I got to get out of the house more, man. I'm working out inside the house and oh man, this whole lockdown shit is just brutal. All right. Kill a Bee's The Sting. This came out in, I want to say 2002? Yeah, 2002. This surprisingly was mostly produced by um, by the RZA. I know there was a couple other producers that produced on here also, but it's you know it's full of Wu Tang affiliates and things like that, and Wu Tang members and stuff. You know, first song on here with Bobby Digital, of course. RZA, you got Inspected Deck. You know, it's got guys all over here like Black Knights are on here, Solomon Child, Prodigal, Timbo King, Twelve O'clock, Shaheem. It just goes on and on. North Stars on here, which is really cool. Um, Shaheem even makes an appearance on here. This must have been pre-going to jail. Or maybe he went to jail about that time. Um, but yeah, you know, it's actually really dope. This is the follow-up to the first one and shit. Uh, to the to the swarm. But I think this is really good. It's got a second disc on here, bonus track. It's got a few kind of remixes and things like that. But just again, surprised that the RZA had done most of the beats on here. I think there's a couple other beats produced by... Um, I can't remember who else produces on here, but it's actually pretty solid. Pretty solid shit. <laughs> so this is an album I completely forgot about. Uh, I had a buddy that had this back in the day. And I actually used to laugh at him for having this. Because I was like, dude, what the fuck? Like, why would you buy something like that? And then we listened to it. And we're like, oh, wow, it's actually pretty good. It's got some really dope beats on it. But this is the uh, the B-Ball's Best Kept Secret. This was a compilation of guys that were in the NBA rapping. So essentially what you had here, you had Dana Barrows on here. Malik Seeley, Shaq was on here, of course. Cedric Sabalas, uh, Brian Shaw, Chris Mills, Jason Kidd, J.R. Ryder, Dennis Scott, Gary Payton. Um, man, some huge, huge fucking names there, man. It's just crazy. Crazy shit, man. Um, of course, Shaq had to be on. The, the song by Shaq on here is actually Mike, Mike Check 1 2, which I believe is on his second on the Shaq Fu album with LL Scratch. Um, crazy thing about this, so it's got like DJ Alamo production. Uh, Amp Banks, QD3, DJ Slip, DJ Clark Kent is on here. Uh, who else? I think Diamond D does the last track on here. Um, the Dana Burrows and Cedric Sabal's track, And You Don't Stop, is actually featuring Diamond D, Grand Puba, AG, and Sadat X, produced by Diamond D. Um, yeah, so really, I mean, most of the guys on here aren't really the greatest MCs. I mean, Cedric Sabalis actually isn't bad. Uh, the song Flow On, produced by Warren G. Actually, not bad. Um, I think Jason Kidd's track's pretty good. The GR Ryder song, Funk in the Trunk, I think that one's produced by Ant Banks, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, man, the production on here is amazing. It's so You can kind of overlook the MCs a little bit, but overall, really solid project, man. I'm glad I remembered about this album, picked it up for a couple bucks, because really, you know, you got to have this in the collection, right? So, uh, Mr. Hyde, uh, Chronicles of the Beast, man. Um, this album came out in 2008. I want to say 2008. I don't know. They never put the years on the back. 2008, I believe. Uh, this is his sophomore record um, that was actually produced mostly by Sean Strange. Oddly enough, yeah, because Necro only produced a couple tracks on here. Uh, Sean Strange produced most of the songs. Uh, I think Hyde even produced a couple tracks on here and stuff. It's, you know, it's a few features. You got Ill Bill, GG Eclipse is on your slain. Um, you know, but overall, really solid album, man. I like Mr. Hyde, man. Uh, which I think he's going by... No, I think that's Gore-Tex that changed his name. Yeah, Hyde didn't change his name. Um, but yeah, I still got to get Hyde's first album, man. I, I still haven't been able to find a, a good, a cheap copy of that, man, which really kind of pisses me off. But um, good shit. This kind of interesting release. It actually comes with a DVD in here too, so which is kind of cool. But yeah, good record, Mr. Hyde. Uh, Lyrical Assassins Compilation. Uh, this was recommended to me by a homie from um, the UK. His name's Steve. Underground Hip Hop Compilation released by Thump Street Records. I think Thump Street actually put out the TWDY re records, if I'm not mistaken, actually, now, now when I think about it. Yeah, so that was Ant Banks' group with Forte and stuff. Uh, 
Yeah, what really caught my eye on this actually was there's a track on here. Like a lot of the MCs, I don't really know. Like, I mean, Metal Supreme, Tree, Atticate, uh, Yip Dog. Like, there's a lot of guys in here I'd never even really heard of. And then it came to play a ham, and I was like, isn't that the dude from the Pentel's Players Click? It is. So this guy actually had a solo track on here, and I was like, damn, that's crazy. So, but uh, yeah, it's got a lot of different type of flavors. This came out in 1998. Has some kind of East Coast kind of sounding beats on here, but it sounds a lot West Coast too. Uh, but later 90s type stuff and this is a solid compilation actually really solid thanks buddy for if you're watching this video for recommending this because um yeah it's just solid man it's actually really really dope shit so but yeah here's another one i remember back in the day being like dude the lineup on this is crazy never picked up a copy for whatever reasons and that is the street fighter soundtrack um you know the crazy thing is is that ice cube actually does the title track on here which I still think is really interesting because I actually have a promo uh, CD release of um, Ice Cube in the movies. And it's basically a compilation of all the soundtrack songs Ice Cube had done uh, over his career. And there's like 15 or 16 tracks on there from various soundtracks. And oddly enough, the Street Fighter soundtrack song is not on that compilation. So I completely forgot about this, uh, which is actually a really dope song. I like it, man. But the, the, the song on here that really kind of sells this shit for me, man, is Come With It. Ahmad Roscos and Saphir. Uh, man, I, that was kind of the start of Roscos, his career, really. This is before he put out his first album and stuff. This is where he kind of got on and shit. I, I know Take a Personal and actually just talked about this, uh, which is kind of cool because um, they had Roscos on the Collabo uh, podcast that they did and stuff, and he talked about that and stuff. But, uh, of course, Ahmad, man, actually kills this shit, man, because he was the guy that did Back in the Day and shit like that. He does a great verse on here, and Saphir is fucking awesome, too. Um, Nos was on here with one on one, the far side, Paris with Street Soldier, uh, Rally Rowl, which I believe I don't even think Rally Rowl ever actually dropped an album. He might have put out an EP or something. The Bums are on here. L Cool J Life As. Actually, that song's produced by Easy Mo B, which is really dope. Craig Mack was on here. You got fucking Hammer and Dion Sanders. And this track right here, straight straight to my feet, is is hilarious. It's like it's so mid '90s Hammer, where he was just on that straight hardcore G funk sound. The shit sounds exactly like fucking George Clinton, man. It's crazy. It's awesome. <laughs> it's kind of cheese ball, but it's funny. Uh, then you got Public Enemy on here, uh, Rumble in the Jungle, which isn't really the greatest song with introducing the Rec League. Uh, Another levels on here, which is cool. And there's a couple other tracks at the end, but solid soundtrack, man. Honestly, lots of great uh, material on here and stuff. So <clears throat> honestly, the, the soundtrack is a lot better than the movie, which I actually do own the movie and it is kind of funny, but whatever. It is what it is. Moving along, man, to, in my opinion, an overlooked and underrated Canadian classic, man. Kish's A Nation of Hoods. This album came out in 1994. Uh, mostly produced by Kish. Um, he also had production from K Cut from um, uh, Main Source, of course. He was originally from Canada and stuff. I think K Cut actually did Crates to Concrete, which was the first single and stuff. But this is like that straight 93, 94 shit. And it just, it's solid from top to bottom, man. I love Kish's flow. He's got a great voice. And actually, speaking of that, so Kish actually moved to. Like shortly after this record, he actually moved to California to pursue a producing career, like not as a rapper, but he wanted to produce for people that didn't really work out for him. So he ended up starting up his starting up his own animation type voiceover company and shit. And now he does voiceovers for like animation. Uh, he's worked on DC movies and things like that. So he's actually been working to this day. He's worked on like hundreds of films. It's actually kind of interesting where his career went, but at least he got to use his voice, you know, to make money and still. So, uh, but yeah, very, very overlooked album, man. I, I think... This shit just like, I don't know why it gets fucking, maybe because Kish's first album, Around the World in 80 Days Long, people didn't really like that. That was, that was kind of white bar, white boy corny shit. I don't know, but but this album is very more, it's very much elevated, a little bit more mature and stuff. And he just comes correct on this, man. It's really, really dope. Um, yeah, got to check it out, man, if you've never heard this. But solid, solid album, man, from Kish. It's too bad he never did another album. That was it. Now he did the two records and then does the DC voiceovers and shit, man. So... Uh, we got uh, Rick Ross's, what the fuck is his name of this album? Deeper Than Rap. I think this is his third album. Production from the Justice League on here. Uh, I know Kanye West is featured on here, who he doesn't even, yeah, he doesn't produce the song, Maybach Music, um, with T-Pain, Lil Wayne, and uh, Kanye West. I thought that was so interesting that West didn't produce the track on there. But actually, Kanye West's verse on that track is actually really good. He actually comes quite correct on that, which I was, I was really kind of shocked by that, so... 
Um, yeah. Uh, overall, not my favorite Ross album, uh, but you know it does have some good joints on here. Um, we got Robin Thicke on here. What was the track? Oh yeah, Foxy Brown is actually fe featured on this record. I think um, John Legend's on here. Uh, the song "Usual Suspects" with Nas is really cool. I know he's worked with Nas a couple different times, which is kind of cool. So, um, but uh, what the, what is the song? Murder Miami with Foxy Brown. Oh yeah, yeah. They they talk about them being Bonnie and Clyde, and that track is kind of cool. So, but yeah, Rick Ross, uh, deeper than rap. Um, it's it's pretty good. It's it's pretty good. It's not one of my favorite ones by him. But. Uh, Rodney O and Joe Cooley, uh, Three the Hard Way. This is uh, their second album that came out in 1990. Their follow up to their 88 classic. Um, <laughs> this album totally sounds like straight 89. Like their flows and shit like that. It's just like straight 89. Uh, but came out in 1990. The thing about Rodney Owen Joe Cooley that makes me laugh is that if you listen to their albums in sequence, like from 88 to 90, they put out one in like 91, like 94. I think their 94 album was like Fuck New York at that time. And then into their later 90s stuff, like they just got more gangster as every album fucking went out because they were really just adjusting to the times. I mean, by 94, gangster music was at its height and shit and it was cool to be like hard on your records and shit. And they were just like adapting to that because if you take like their first album to like their latest, 90 album <laughs> it's fucking it's like two different groups man it's hilarious this shit's still pretty you know on that kind of hip-hop level where they're not really talking some gangsta shit uh it's, it's pretty fun man like djs and mcs part two and shit um there's some pretty cool tracks hocus pocus is kind of funny uh but uh yeah what is the track on here oh yeah fun 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 that's the one it's like a throwback track man it sounds like like 84 85 type shit which is kind of funny because the shit already sounds really old school anyways but um yeah Rod Young and I, I need to get their third the album that came out after this one because that's the one I really like and I'm missing that one so when shit goes back to normal maybe I'll jump try to get a copy of that but uh Rod Young and Joe Cooley I never really hear people talk about these guys too much kind of kind of an underrated group man kind of just kind of slid out there and did like they must have like seven or eight albums too it's crazy uh Salt and Peppa's record, uh, Black Magic's, Black's Magic, 1990. I won't lie, I'd never heard this full album until last year. I was just going through records and I was like, you know what? I'm going to pick that record up because I've actually never heard it. It was for like 50 cents, so why not? Uh, this is the album with uh, Let's Talk About Sex. And the interesting thing about Let's Talk About Sex is that that was the fourth single off this album. It, to me, that seems very strange that that would be like the fourth single because it was such a huge song you think they would have tried to release that first and stuff because i believe they had these songs done and it's just the sequence of singles being released for this album are very very bizarre to me they had six singles off this record man i can't i can't even remember what they all were to be honest um but yeah there were six singles i think doper than dope was one you showed me i think was another one but it's just crazy this version of the release actually has the expression that was another single expression uh, which actually has the remix at the end here too, but kind of a mixed bag of album. It's got like songs like Let's Talk About Sex and and very kind of other songs like that, but then it's got some very hip hop tracks on here too, which is kind of interesting. But uh, um, yeah, what's I think actually Black's Magic is actually like one of the dopest tracks on this album, but but yeah, very dope album cover. I like the album cover on this too. Yeah. Salt and Pepper, you know, they had such a great career, man. Put out like five albums, every album in gold, platinum. Big ups to them for selling. Uh, DJ Faust, Man or Myth. This is basically a DJ cut record. You know, it's DJs just cut and wax over fucking beats, man. So I love these type of records released on Bomb, Bomb Records. Uh, 2007, uh, I think this actually, yeah, they released this in 2007. This is actually from 1998, though, I believe. I'm pretty fucking positive it is. Um, but yeah, so if you're into those kind of beat tapes where DJs are just cutting up wax and shit like that, I can throw these things on all the time. They actually have a series bomb records that put out like a whole series of like five or six volumes of just straight DJ fucking cutting up wax and shit. I'll, I'll eventually show those off. I have all the volumes. So, um, but if you're into that type of shit and I've been asked if I had any of these kind of beat tapes where DJs are just cutting up wax and just scratching like shit and... I do have lots of these, so if you're if you're watching this right now and you want recommendations, I can give them to you. So, uh, but DJ Foss this is really dope, really dope shit. Uh, Apathy and self-titled, no place like Chrome. Ugh, man, you know I used to like this a lot more when it came out. It came out what 2007, 
Yeah, this came out in 2007, too. Um, yeah, I think the DJ5... No, I think that actually is... No, I was reading the fucking... The product number 2007. Yeah, that was from 98. <laughs> Driven balls on that. Anyways. Self-titled. Apathy, no place like Chrome. Uh, th this feels like it, it, it was kind of like thrown together because Apathy has like four solo joints on here. Self-titled has like a couple solo joints on here. They do... Uh, there's 11 tracks, so there's like five of them where they do together. Some features on here with Jay Zone, who actually produces that track, I believe. Fill the Agony's on here, one, two, uh, Magic Most, things like that. You know, it, but I don't know, man. It just, I used to like this a lot more. It's definitely not their best work. The song Sit Your Face or Fix Your Face is got to be one of the weirdest fucking songs that these guys have ever done. It just has this strange vibe to it. It's just totally bizarro. I don't really know, but yeah. Next up here, we're pushing like 30 minutes on this. MC Light, Light is a Rock. I was trying to keep these things around 30 minutes, hence the 25 albums. Uh, Light is a Rock, this is their debut album from 1988. Um, you know, this is an album that came out at a time where a lot of albums from this period were put on pedestals and kind of, you know, just kind of given that classic stamp, you know. I don't think this is MC Light's best album. I feel like this album has a lot of uh, filler on it. Of course, 10% Diss is like a classic album or classic track. Um, you got production from the Alliance on here, which is really cool, from Alliance. Uh, Audio 2 does, like, four or five of the songs on here. Uh, Prince Paul does, uh, like, Swing, which is actually really cool. Kind of, It just has that kind of De La Soul feel to it a little bit. Um, but, you know, overall, I, I feel like some of the production on here is just not even that great, even for 88. It doesn't age well and stuff. I know this was, you know, featured in uh, Check the Technique in the book and stuff as classic record, but I actually like MC Light's follow-up albums better than this, her second and third album better than this album, but... It's still good. It's just, it doesn't age well. I don't really like to listen to it a whole lot, but yeah. 10% Diss is still classic, but uh, yeah. And last up for the update, we have an album from Blue and Tarak. Um, they formed a group called Crack, which I can't remember exactly what it stands for. The Peace Talks. This album came out in 2008. 2008. Um, I, got, I got on this Blue kick last year and I, and I bought like a bunch of records that I hadn't didn't have in the collection and stuff and this is one i remember when it came out i remember being talked on the hip-hop underground forums quite a lot and I, I remember listening to it back in the day being like oh it was pretty good you know never picked it up and then found a copy for relatively cheap and you know decided to check it out it's kind of a mixed bag man it starts out really bad like some some of the tracks in the beginning is slow and just like weird gets into it gets better as it progresses and then it kind of tapers off at the end so it's very average it's not like terrible or nothing but for blue I do respect the fact that he always does different shit with producers. He's always coming with different sounds and different, you know, different types of albums and shit like that. But, you know, sometimes when you get that experimental, it doesn't really work out for the best all the time. But lo and behold, you know, he's still dope. But uh, this album right here is definitely not one of my favorites, the Peace Talk. So, yeah, it is what it is. So that is going to conclude uh, part four. Four of my, I don't know how many parts. I, I would assume this is probably going to be like 20 parts at least or something. I don't even know. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, leave your comments down below. If you like to give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. That's always welcome too, man. I actually really like that. Um, but yeah, so I'll be back probably in a couple days. You know, really, I might as well just do these every couple days because I feel like I'm just going to be in the house for a long time, like too much time. So, like I said, it's going to give me a good chance to start knocking out some of these. And I actually started to kind of organize all the shit that, that I need to update. So, it'll be easier to kind of mix up the update. Because I was just kind of pulling out these things randomly. And I realized I was doing it pretty interesting. Because I was pulling out, like, female albums and, like, compilations and things. I was like, oh, well. So, I'll kind of stick with that flow. Because I was looking back on the updates. I'm like, that kind of is funny. So, I do have a next one ready to go right here. So, I'll do that one in a couple days. And... And then get through this so then I can organize the whole collection and then uh, do a re-updated shelf-by-shelf series, which will be long as fuck. So. so, oh, if you guys are still watching right now, if you guys want me to start doing uh, top 10 videos, give me some ideas down below for like top 10 say albums of whatever top 10 producer MC. I, I mean i've done a top 10 producer mc type out or a video before but just ideas for like just fun top 10 videos i don't make best of videos i make favorite videos so but anyways uh i'm sure i won't get any re 
any uh, suggestions because this is at the end of the video. <laughs> no, no one watches to the end. So, uh, but uh, anyways, if you guys do, just leave your suggestions down below, and I'll check you guys later. And as usual, 